Well, hello everyone and welcome to the White House. And I know that many of you travel to be a part of this moment and haven't taken time away from your family and other necessary work. So we're grateful to all of you for giving us just a little more of that time this morning now that yesterday's storm has passed. <laughs> it, I'm telling you, it was so quiet here at the White House last night because ev they sent everybody home. There was no Secret Service. And no, I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank you, all of you, for, uh, for being here. And our purpose today is powerful. So I want to thank you for your commitment to this cause. And as some of you probably know, probably everybody here knows it, I teach at a community college not far from here. And right now, we're, you know, educators are in the final weeks of those summer breaks, you know, where they, the teachers are putting the finishing touches on their lesson plans. I know I am. I have my first article all run off. I'm ready to go. The linoleum floors, as you all walk into the schools, you know, they're just wax. They never look like that again after the first day. You know, the scuffs of sneakers, and there's a possibility, the hum of possibility, in the air as the year seems to stretch out in front of us. And um, you know, you feel that excitement. If any of you are in the classroom, which I'm sure most of you have been, or you know, you can't sleep, even sleep the night before, right? No matter how many years it's been, you still feel that excitement. You know, it's the new year uh, filled with amazing things to discover as we learn and we grow together. And with each new semester, technology becomes a more indispensable part of making sure that our students' imaginations can soar and ensuring that administrators can run their schools smoothly and safely. But in districts around the country, cyber attacks have brought those systems to a halt. And I know most of you have seen it. Social security numbers and medical records stolen and shared online. Classroom technology paralyzed and lessons ended. So if we want to safeguard our children's futures, we must protect their personal data. And that's why my husband, Joe, is bringing together experts from across his administration to help strengthen cybersecurity for our elementary, middle, and high schools. So today, not only do we have with us the Secretary of Education, the Secretary of Homeland Security, and the Chairwoman of the Federal Communications Commission. And we're joined from, by leaders from the National Security Council, the Office of the National Cyber Director, uh, the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, <laughs> and the FBI. That one was easy. <laughs> so uh, they'll be announcing resources for districts like yours and sharing best practices to help stop those attacks before they begin and resolve them more quickly when they do. But we can't do this alone. And that's why we're working with businesses across the country. And later, they'll be sharing the new commitments they are making to ensure the technology of our classrooms is reliable and more secure. I know because I teach in a computer lab. So it's going to take all of us, local governments, state and federal agencies, educators, businesses, labor leaders, and nonprofits sharing our good ideas and innovative solutions to protect our students. So I'm grateful to all of you for being part of these discussions. You are on the front line supporting your communities. And I want to ask you to keep going together each day we're building the foundation of our children's future, and we must do all that we can to keep it sound and strong and ready for whatever life may bring. Because every student deserves the opportunity to see a, a school counselor when they're struggling and not worry that these conversations will be shared with the world. Every classroom should be enriched by new technologies, 
giving students who love computers the skills they need to succeed. And every family should know its information will stay safe and secure so that our children can keep reaching for the endless possibilities that exist inside of the, each one of them. So thank you. Thank you all for what you're doing. Thanks. Thank you. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce someone who is working tirelessly to support our children and their digital security. Secretary Miguel Cardona, my friend. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. How is everyone? Isn't it great to have a teacher in the White House? How about Dr. <laughs> Dr. Biden? Thank you. Thank you for your leadership and, and for always understanding how important it is uh, to make sure that our schools are safe for our students and our educators and uh, for championing it the way you do. And I want to thank everyone for being here. I know we had a little bit of a curveball yesterday, but either you packed well or you supported our local uh, stores and bought yourself another shirt for today. Um, really, really glad that you're here, that we're here together, um, here to discuss a very important topic, cybersecurity in our schools. When we were at the height of the pandemic, it wasn't board games uh, that got my, my own children the socialization that they need. It wasn't even books or sports because, you know, they weren't able to get out onto the field. For my son, at the time, he was uh, about 16 years old, it was his Xbox. And for those of you with teenagers, you, you, may, know, you may know where I'm going with this. He was playing Madden with his cousins online. He was socializing with his family members and his friends. That was the socialization he was getting. For my daughter, who was about 14 at the time, it was an app called House Party. Anyone familiar with that? Well, that was her way of seeing her friend's face. Because she was told two weeks later, you're going to be back in school. And after the second month, it was really hard and scary. So that's what she used to socialize with her friends. And I mention this first because it shows that technology can benefit our young people. At its best, technology can help our students connect with each other and their learning in a way that nothing else can. It also reminds us that we live in a digital age. As I always say, the device is the new pencil in our schools. Last school year, the average number of unique educational technology tools accessed per school district was over 2,500. And keep in mind, those numbers don't even capture the social media apps students are using or the digital infrastructure and systems our schools rely on. So when schools face cyber attacks, the impacts can be huge. Think about the ransomware attack that led to more than 500,000 students and staff members in Chicago public schools having their personal information disclosed. Or think about the school district in my home state of Connecticut that had to postpone the first day of school for 18,000 students because a cyber attack hit a system the district used to manage school bus routes. Let's be clear, we need to be taking these cyber attacks on school as seriously as we do the physical attacks on critical infrastructure. That's why today, the Department of Education released a series of briefs on how to strengthen the digital infrastructure of education. We need collaboration within government to make that possible, which is why we're also committing to establish a new government coordinating council. Look, we can't talk about intentional collaboration at the local level, at the state level, if we're not modeling it here at the federal level. And that's what we're going to do. I'm really excited about that. I think that's the direction we need to be. We need to be proactive about this. We need to get the best thinking from all over the country and be proactive, not wait for emergencies to happen to make sure we have a plan. These represent big steps forward. Together, we can better manage the risks of cyber attacks on our schools so we can better guarantee the benefits technology has to offer our children in education. 
I want to give a special thanks to Christina Ishmael over here <laughs> and our Office of Educational Technology for their leadership. The passion that she has not only on uh, protecting students from cybersecurity, but in intentional collaboration is what we need here. And I appreciate your leadership and uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Cindy Martin also, your passion on this topic. As a former superintendent of schools in San Diego, you recognize how critical this is and what an opportunity we have to lead our country in this space. So thank you for your leadership as well. And speaking of leadership and, and partners, I am really delighted to um, introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, my cabinet colleague, but really a, a friend, someone that I've uh, grown to know over the last two and a half years and, and really admire the passion um, with which he leads, uh, our Secretary Mallorca. Secretary. <laughs> Good morning, thank you, Secretary Cardona. Dr. Biden, thank you for convening us and for hosting us. I should say at the very outset that I have always, always loved school, Ex <laughs> except math. Um, all of us uh, here today are acutely aware of how demanding it is to work in education. The challenges that students, teachers, parents, administrators, school board members, front office staff, tech support and outside vendors even, confront every day would have been unfathomable even five years ago. Cybersecurity threats are merely the latest such challenge. I wish that were not the case. The education ecosystem, like critical care units in hospitals, should be sacrosanct, free from cyber attacks and other threats. Children deserve the ability to learn and grow in a secure setting, and you all deserve the ability to focus on what you do best, teaching, nurturing, caring for, and inspiring our children. The reality, though, is that the cyber threats we face have expanded to every community and every institution across our country, including schools. That is why we at the Department of Homeland Security, alongside our partners across the Biden-Harris administration are committed to providing communities and school systems with the support and the resources necessary to protect themselves, their infrastructure, and their students. Earlier this year, we released, through CISA, our Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and its extraordinary leader, Jen Easterly, is here, a free first of its kind cybersecurity toolkit for K through 12 institutions, compiling government resources and offering guidance on how stakeholders can best implement them. We're also working closely with technology manufacturers to ensure that what they provide to school systems is secure by design, secure right out of the box. And to paraphrase President Biden, we are showing our values not only in our words and in our actions, but in our budgets as well. Earlier today, we put out a new call for applications to our state and local cybersecurity grant program, which for the second year in a row will make hundreds of millions of dollars available to school districts and governments to harden their cyber defenses. We have many, many other means of support available to you from teams across our federal government, and our colleagues will highlight many of them for you throughout this summit. I want to strongly urge every school system and every community to take advantage of these resources and to do so with urgency. Do not underestimate the ruthlessness of those who wish to do us harm. They have proven their willingness to steal and release such private student information as psych psychiatric hospitalizations, home struggles, and suicide attempts. Do not wait until a crisis comes to start preparing for one. An ounce, <laughs> that applause was prompted by our Deputy National Security Advisor, friend and colleague, uh, Ann, Ann Neuberger.
an ounce of prevention today is worth a pound of cure tomorrow, especially when an ounce of prevention enables you to spend more time on what really matters, the education and well-being of our students. I join First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, Secretary Cardona, in thanking you for being here. I thank you for your commitment to our children and our schools and to building a better tomorrow. Our Deputy National Security Advisor, Ann, will kick off the rest of the summit. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here today, particularly because it is take two. Thank you to all who stayed overnight to come together, to meet each other, and to work together on this incredibly important topic for our children. By my count, we have an incredible group today. We have nearly 20 school superintendents in this room from across the United States. From Talladega County Schools, Dr. Susanna Lacey, to Albuquerque Public Schools, Mr. Robert Elder. A thank you to all the school superintendents who have traveled here to be here today. We have teachers like Ms. Kathleen Bullock, second grade special ed teacher from Brent Elementary Schools here in DC, and teachers associations like the National Association of Secondary School Principals. We have at least 15 CIOs and Chief Information Security Officers, folks who are on the front lines on the topic of cyber. From Cambridge, Massachusetts, Mr. John Craman, to Fulton County in Georgia, Ms. Emily Bell. There's education company CEOs from Girls Security, City Bridge, and ClassLink, and founders of Gula Tech Adventures and Diverting Hate, among others and almost more, and almost 200 people gathered here today, committed to education, committed to school. Each of you deserve your own recognition for what you do for kids. Thank you for what you do for children every day. Thank you truly for being here today to discuss an important issue that whether one is an administrator, a teacher, a parent, it's close to each of our hearts. I'd also like to take a moment to welcome close colleagues from the White House, Dr. Arthi Prabhakar, the President's Lead Science Advisor, and Ms. Campbell Walden, Acting National Cyber Director. Our gathering today and the quick reschedule, putting this on Dr. Biden's and the Secretary's calendars, represents really the priority that keeping kids safe means to the President and the entire administration, because today is about that commitment to ensure our kids can go back to school safely. Criminals are targeting schools with cyber attacks. There were eight school systems in the last school year alone that were disrupted, four that actually had to close for a period of time because of cyber attacks. And as we heard, that's a part of it. Perhaps even more importantly, there's sensitive data of children their psychiatric information, sensitive information that really should be protected, released online, data that hurts kids, hurts families, and potentially hurts their futures. So today is about changing that dynamic together. Keeping our students, our teachers, and our schools safe from cyber attacks is about three things. Equipping schools with knowledge, funds, and people the knowledge of how to prevent cyber attacks and respond quickly if they do occur, the funds to ensure that school tech can be upgraded and secure, and finally, the people, because we know that school IT administrators are often short-staffed. So expert teams to help them do the work and secure their schools is key. And today you'll hear significant commitments announced by both government and private sector in each of those categories, knowledge, funds, and people. You'll hear about that in each of the panels. We'll begin with a panel
focused on learning from a ransomware incident against a school. We'll move to an announcement of government commitments, then one of private sector commitments, funds, security, secure tech, and finally, we look forward to welcoming a group of school leaders who inspired us by the innovation they brought to their schools after a significant ransomware attack. So now that we're reset, I'd like to invite the first panel of speakers to join me on the stage. So I'm pleased to introduce our first panel of speakers. Just about a year ago, on Labor Day weekend, the Los Angeles Unified School District experienced a very significant ransomware attack that disrupted the district's access to email and key systems and applications they need to operate their schools. However, as you're about to hear, the swift action by the school district, closely supported by the federal government, ensured LA schools opened on time on September 5th, a remarkable example of the power of leadership, preparation, and collaboration. I can share from my own experience over that Labor Day weekend that school superintendent Alberto Carvalho calls for support were met with quick action. The White House convened federal departments and agencies, and the Department of Education became the focal point for leading that response. So here to speak about the lessons learned from the Department of Education's perspective, I invite Deputy Secretary Cindy Martin, a former school, school superintendent herself, and a passionate leader on education and focus on the health and safety of kids. Deputy Secretary Martin. Thank you so much for that introduction, and more importantly, thank you for your collaboration. You heard our secretary talk about intentional collaboration. That's what we believe at the Department of Education. In simple kindergarten terms, we say teamwork makes a dream work. I was a kindergarten teacher, so we'll always bring that in. But your collaboration and the way you help bring all of the folks together that we could galvanize for support when we got that phone call, Labor Day weekend, from Superintendent Carvalho, as being a former superintendent in San Diego, I knew he needed help, and he needed help now. And I understand President Biden's commitment to a whole government approach, our secretary's commitment to being a service agency, we went into quick action. But the action wasn't us deciding at the federal level, what do we need to do to LA Unified or for LA Unified as if we had the answers, although we had critical information they needed. We needed to listen closely to our superintendent, what he needed immediately on the ground so we could bring the support together in a synchronistic way that would get the outcomes that I knew he needed to get his schools open for the first day of school, which is most important because kindergartners only get their, own, their first day of kindergarten once. And so we got on the phone very quickly and you talked about what you needed and then we started collaborating. And so I'm yielding the rest of my time so you can hear from him on how he led impeccably what happened. Although we wished it never happened, it did. And we want to hear lessons learned because this is what you and I dreamed up back then when it was going on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to begin by, number one, thanking the vision, the collaboration, the courage, and the determination of this administration and its leaders. Uh, Dr. Biden, uh, Secretary Mayorkas, and my dear friend, uh, Secretary Cardona, and my dear, dear friend, uh, Cindy Martin. And uh, two people who I called on that fateful weekend are actually on this stage. Uh, first, Cindy Martin, and second, Ann Neuberger. Uh, the level of collaboration uh, that we benefited from, from every single federal agency, as well as local and state governments, was really unparalleled, and put us in a position of being able to resume regular schooling without disruption the Tuesday after Labor Day uh, weekend. So I'd like to detail for you very, very quickly three phases of what we went through. Number one, pre-event preparation. Secondly, uh, event crisis management in a very strategic way. And thirdly, post-event decisions and resiliency building based on the learned experience. So prior to the event, I have to say that LAUSD probably had a set of assets, tools, and systems in place, as well as professional development and human skill assets uh, that were s uh, significantly above average. 
Uh, we had multi-factor authentication on its way. We had protocols for training of staff uh, on management and protection. Uh, but we had also began work uh, with private sector entities in ensuring that data exchange agreements were in place, ensuring that the protocols, prerequisites, and uh, elements of protection that we demanded were reflected in the vast majority of contracts with private sector entities that relied on data exchange with our school system, ensuring that there were no unnecessary doors open. In addition to that, uh, we had began the work of uh, actually securing our systems uh, in the event of this type of attack. What we had not done uh, was what we were able to build during the event, which is actually develop a Rolodex of influencers in solving the problem. So the calls to the FBI, to Cindy Martin, the Department of Education, Deputy Secretary Martin, uh, to uh, National Security Council, I remember a phone conversation with Ann Neuberger at the White House. Uh, the fact that a day later we had 11 special agents with the FBI and federal entities in our house co-managing the situation was incredibly powerful. But let me speak very briefly about one critical thing we did, which was since we had individuals 24-7 monitoring uh, the flow of data, we were able to detect an attempt at exfiltrating information from our system. We made a critical decision to actually shut down all systems. That benefited us at two levels. Number one, out of the 11 million um, gigabytes of information we possess, only 500 gigabytes were exfiltrated. Still significant, but it could have been much worse. We knew that we're going after significant assets specific to payroll systems, personally identifiable social security numbers and student data, as well as contract information for our multi-billion dollar general obligation bond. They were able to encrypt systems. They were able to exfiltrate very little of those systems because of our swift action. It was the unparalleled bringing down of governmental silos that often exist by having CISA, FBI, NSC, uh, as well as local and state entities come together and work on the same stage that we were able to recover quickly. So here are my learnings and strong advice to the nation. Number one, have a backup plan that is independent from your digital assets and systems to restore education for kids, particularly attendance taking, transportation, food service, critically important payroll. We were able to transition very quickly because we had backup plans that we were able to activate very quickly. Secondly, have that Rolodex ready to call on individuals who can help you manage a crisis, a situation that you yourself alone cannot manage. You do not have the tools or the intelligence. Federal agencies had and they delivered big time very, very quickly. Thirdly, have an understanding with those agencies about elements that you should share. So when we shut down our systems, we were able to create a laboratory for federal agencies to be able to retrieve information, the nuggets of information that the bad actor had left behind. They were able to study it very, very quickly, report it back to us, inform the nation. The combination of those efforts proved powerful. Post-incident, uh, we were able to restore all of our systems. Uh, we were able to reopen schools without interruption, feed kids and transport kids and take attendance. But we recognized that the one entity we needed uh, wasn't in place yet. So we moved quickly in achieving three things. Number one, strict guidelines for private sector interaction with us specific to data exchange. Secondly, the hiring of a CISO, which we did not have. And I know there are many smaller rural districts in America that will not have the resources to go out and hire a CISO. Rely on our larger districts, on consortia, on associations to share the cost of that type of talent. Do not go without one. Thirdly, critically, critically important, aggressive professional development, the retooling and reskilling of our own workforce on the basis of what we learned. More often than not, and that was our, our case, after an extensive audit and analysis of the incident, even redoubling our efforts in terms of 
exposing our own vulnerabilities through intensive periodic penetration tests to determine the resiliency of our systems. More often than not, it is not necessarily the extreme expertise of the cyber terrorist that will gain access to your system. It is a back door that's left open. That was our case. So we've learned from this experience. Uh, we also brought to the board something that is a strong recommendation, alter through delegated authority the ability to procure while living up to government in sunshine, public records laws, contracts with assets, tools, and systems without necessarily unwarrantedly broadcasting to the wider community, including the bad actors, how you are arming yourself and protecting yourself. I close by once again thanking every agency represented here for the support they provided us and in return the information we were able to reciprocally provide to the nation that I believe has resulted in a better level of preparation. I've never seen the level of collaboration that I've seen. And the very last thing, we did pen a letter uh, to the nation uh, requesting additional support and additional flexibility in terms of funding co-signed uh, by over 2,000 educational leaders across the country originating from Los Angeles. And I appreciate the fact because this administration, this government read it, understood the crisis, and responded with resources, toolkits, and support. Thank you very much. I think if anyone doubted that experience is the best teacher, even among a group of teachers, I think your words, Arbato, would put, those, would put that to rest. I'd like to now turn it over to the deputy director of the FBI, who had a minor crisis right behind him. Um, <laughs> deputy director of the FBI, Paul Abate. Uh, thank you, Ann. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having us here today. It's a great privilege to join these colleagues and partners. Um, I'm just going to echo and reinforce everything that the superintendent said. Uh, when we look at, uh, you know, our number one goal in advance is to be preventative and to stop cyber attacks from occurring before they, before they happen. And that requires the ultimate collaboration uh, that was on display here. In the unfortunate uh, inst instances and situations where an attack uh, does occur, what the Los Angeles Unified School District uh, had done in advance and what they did in the midst of the crisis, the decisions made, is a model uh, for exactly how we would suggest everyone do it. Uh, but I want to go back to beforehand because, as the superintendent said, we knew each other before the crisis occurred, and that made all the difference uh, in the world. In fact, uh, some of our agents and analysts and leadership were on the campus with um, partners and colleagues from the school district just the week before, which is you know, pretty amazing. And having those trusted relationships put us in a position to help and support the school district in responding to what occurred there, and then helping uh, to recover and reconstitute uh, very quickly, as was described. The two messages I want to bring to uh, each and every one of you from the FBI is one, form and build that relationship of trust uh, on preparedness in advance, so for hopefully we can prevent something bad from happening, but if it does occur, we're in a position to help and support you uh, and responding to it. And in the event that something does happen, if there is a cyber attack, please call us immediately because timeliness does matter. And that's what uh, was on display here. We were able to send in a complement of uh, agents, investigators, analysts, technical experts, computer scientists, data scientists, and others. Um, within 24 hours, we had teams on the ground both from our local office in Los Angeles. Here from headquarters, we have what we call a cyber action team, which is compri comprised of the ultimate experts uh, in response and within this discipline in handling cyber threats. And we had uh, 15 personnel and more on the ground immediately side by side, by side with our partners uh, from the school district. And it matters in multiple ways. One, we're a victim-focused organization. We care, so we're there to provide support, reassurance, all the information and intelligence that we can share with a victim and bring to bear in resolving the crisis, and that was on display here. 
there's real actions we can take. As the superintendent uh, described, we were able to freeze two cloud accounts based on the information we gleaned very quickly and prevent sensitive and personally identifiable information that pertain to students and staff members and teachers from getting out into the public that the, that the cyber criminals were using to attempt to extort the school district. That was huge. We were able to take the information and intelligence gleaned quickly and package that with our partners from CISA and Jen and issue a cybersecurity, cybersecurity advisory quickly, which informed other potential victims and put them in a position to further defend their networks and systems. We were also able to identify cryptocurrency wallets uh, that the bad actors were using uh, and again, gather indicators of compromise that went into the uh, advisory. All of these things happened very quickly and no doubt led to preventing other attacks from occurring against other school districts um, across the country and probably uh, even around the world. Um, we're also able to um, serve as a gateway for other government resources to come in. With CISA, with us, we mutually inform each other when things occur. We want to do that rapidly so we can bring all of our resources bear, to bear collectively from across the federal government and beyond. All of these things matter. So again, I would say um, make the relationship if you don't have it already. We have 56 main hub field offices around the country, and then we have several hundred sub offices. Every square inch of our great country is covered, and there's somebody there for you if you don't have the relationship already. We're here for you in that regard. And in the event that something happens, call us immediately, and I promise you and assure you that we will have the personnel there side by side with our partners in government to help you get back on your feet and protect people and protect people going forward in the future. So um, thank you for the partnership to each and every one of you, and thank you all for giving us the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Ann. Thank you so much. I want to take a moment. I want to take a moment you know, to note, as the applause noted, that what Paul was referencing was that the FBI is available 24-7. When we called on the cyber incident, if I recall correctly, it was either Friday or Saturday night, and there was no question that a team of men and women would, on a holiday weekend, go where the mission called them, go where they were needed. And for that, just a moment of applause and appreciation for the men and women. <laughs> So as we're hearing, an ounce of preparation is worth many, many pounds of going through an incident. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the director of CISA, the Cyber Infrastructure and Protection Agency, Director Jen Easterly. Great. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you for your leadership. You know, I've been doing this for almost three decades, and the level of collaboration, I love the teamwork makes the dream work, exactly, uh, across the federal government, state and local industry is better than it's ever been. And I won't add a ton to what's already been said other than to really reinforce that what you just heard from Superintendent Carvalho is truly the Harvard Business School case study of how to get this right. I mean, not just the building resilience ahead of time, but also how the actual response was handled in terms of the sharing information with FBI, with CISA, knowing that it might not just be a threat to the LA Unified School District, it could be a threat to other school districts. So sharing that information rapidly so that we could do that advisory that Paul talked about. Sharing information transparently, saying what was going on. You might not know everything at the moment that it occurs, but certainly providing information to keep people informed was incredibly important, both to the government, but of course, to the students and the parents of the Unified School District. And this event today means so much to me as director of CISA, but more so as a mom, because I know what that's like to have that uncertainty. Certainly, uh, many of us went through it in the pandemic. So we are doing what Paul just mentioned, where he's got field offices around the country. We have built out uh, our folks in the field, cybersecurity advisors, state coordinators, many of the CIOs and CISOs who are here have worked with my teams out there. We are there also to provide support. 
One of the other things that was sparked by the incident last September was the toolkit that we worked on with great uh, friends across the community. I think Doug Levin's out there from K-12-6 uh, to ensure that educators, school districts, teachers have basic tools that they need to be able to implement the basic protections. We understand that schools are often target rich, sadly, as Anne said, but resource constrained. And so we want to be there with our free services, with our best advice, with our guidance, with our counsel to make sure that you all have what you need to raise the baseline on cybersecurity, but also importantly, to know how to respond effectively to reduce and mitigate that risk and be the example that you just heard about from Superintendent Carvalho. So I'm pleased to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you all for sharing your invaluable perspectives. We have and one last question for the superintendent. Fantastic. So did you pay the ransom? Did I pay the ransom? We don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> we did not pay the ransom. And I have to say that uh, my last comment on that, uh, we would never. And by the way, that was a very elegantly stated recommendation from our partners at the FBI. So we're not telling you what to do. However, it never really pans out well when you pay you inspire future attacks, and there's no guarantee that the information you're preventing, attempting to prevent from being disseminated, will not make its way to the dark web anyway. For the folks, uh, educator superintendents, create a task force if you're attacked of the best talent across the globe. We did that without compensation in a non-conflicting way. And then establish a running committee of experts that meets in a privileged way to discuss the measures you've taken and the ongoing acquisitions that you're willing to make. And the last thing, force your boards to acknowledge this as a high priority and budget accordingly. We usually don't. Thank you. Thank you all so much. We'll now transition to our second panel, and I welcome those panelists to join us on stage. Thank you all very much for the superb panel. So we heard a great deal about proactive planning, resourcing, and quick action, and the role that plays in keeping schools safe. The attack on LA schools made it critical for us to address the gaps in resources, the gaps in people on a national scale that our K-12 schools need. The Biden-Harris administration is keenly focused on ensuring the support schools needed, the almost 14,000 school districts can be better equipped to protect and defend students, teachers, and staff. So this next panel will focus on new efforts, new announcements from across the federal government that we're launching today to support schools across the United States in preventing, defending against, and responding to cyber attacks. So again, to lead things off, I asked Deputy Secretary of Education, Cindy Martin, to kick off the work the, the Department of Education is doing to keep kids safe. Thank you so much. Yes, I'll join this panel too. I really appreciate hearing from our superintendent. Asking superintendent, school boards, school districts to go up against these bad actors is like giving them a plastic spoon and saying good luck. Like they don't always have the knowledge, the base, and the resources what to do. And so to be able to hear directly from Harvard case study examples, is that what you called it? Yeah. Like pitch perfect, I think you called some of the responses we saw in LA. And um, I know you heard advice from Superintendent Carvalho about have it in your Rolodex, who to call. Maybe not everyone had my phone number. He happened to because, you know, we're former superintendents together. But we're here for you. The Biden-Harris administration, this whole team is here for you. And that's why we wanted this panel to be here so you could see what we're doing to put together in terms of a government coordinating council and the way we can all show up for you if the worst happens, but also before that happens, as our, as Anne did during Secretary Mayorkas' opening, let off the applause about have a plan, be ready before something happens is severely the best case. And I want to recognize the fact that Superintendent Carvalho did what I think the best leaders 
do. The best leaders not just have a plan and are prepared and respond during the moment and come up with something to do afterwards and put together the action plan and the task force. He did one more thing that he's not going to share himself. He sat up here to share lessons learned with everybody else. And the best leaders do that. You take what you've been through and like good teachers, you teach others. And so that's what we're doing in terms of putting together from the Department of Education our response to be able to support the field, small, rural, urban, tribal, all across the country. Everybody needs support. And we can take the lessons learned from one of the largest districts in the country and apply it to the smallest, the most urban, the most rural, the mo all across the country. And that's really what we're here to do. Because if you look at the data, and we have specific numbers, the K-6 is a nonprofit that tracks these kinds of incidents. From 2016 to 2022, K-12 public schools and districts experienced 1,619 that we know of cybersecurity related incidents. This is not a small problem. This is not an isolated problem that happens sometimes. It's pervasive enough that action is necessary. And as Anne said in the beginning, it's the knowledge, it's the resources, and it's the people. Levels of action to implement a real response here so that we can address ransomware attacks and keep our schools and our students safe from this. So a little later, you're gonna to get to hear from several states that we've learned from. We have some very innovative approaches out there of what it takes to build a really defensible and resilient digital infrastructure. If we know what to do and we know what works, let's give that knowledge to everybody so everybody can apply that. And when they do occur, if something like this happens, it will have little widespread or lasting impact and it can be addressed expediently with the knowledge base that we have. So you're also gonna to get to hear from the CIO from San Diego who I have to give a shout out from because that's my hometown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There he is over there, Terry. Yes, I was superintendent in San Diego Unified for eight years and taught there for my whole career in San Diego before coming here. So you'll hear about the CIO, from the CIO in San Diego about how the County Office of Education supports 42 school districts in the county, including, of course, San Diego Unified, my former district. And you'll hear real practical information on how that's being done at a school county level where there's 42 districts involved. But let's continue the conversation here. What are we doing to strengthen cybersecurity? What are the concrete, actionable deliverables that are out there for you to be able to take advantage of now? You already know, hopefully, especially since we started yesterday and then continued to today, but the department d released in partnership with CISA the Defensible Resilient K-12 Digital Infrastructure Brief, and in that we're highlighting the cybersecurity recommendations and also all of the promising practice that we know exist out there that we've learned from states, from counties, from districts, from leaders across the country. We put it in one place for you. One stop shop, one place to go. It's not the end all be all, but it's what we know today. And if we know it, we might as well share it. So as my friend already mentioned, the single most important thing that you can do is to prepare. And if you can prepare and put together incident response plans, we do it all the time as teachers. We have fire drills. We have emergency drills, we need cyber drills. Plan for this, you know what to do, and if you don't, we'll help you, and you can put this plan in place. So have the cybersecurity fire drills, because you know, the cybersecurity threats can really feel kind of overwhelming, and given the limited resources that you all have. Like, what are we supposed to do to prepare? We have limited resources, and if we have funding, I want to pay for more support for third grade reading. I have to pay for a CISO now too. Like how do I put this together in a way that you can use the resources that are there for you? We know that there are district technology leaders across the country that can use the brief that we're publishing today to prioritize what are the highest impact actions. If you have a list of things to do and you're not quite sure where to start, turn to the resources that we're providing to say, here are the top three things you can do now, you can do today, with the limited resources we know that you have. Believe me, I understand limited resources. I was a superintendent for eight years, and every year for eight years submitted a budget to my board that included cuts. Keeping my kids safe, making sure they were learning while cutting is the calculus superintendents are constantly having to do, and we believe the guidance we're putting out is helping and understanding the context in which our leaders are leading. And since vendors have an important role to play here in protecting our digital infrastructure, I know vendors should also follow 
all of the recommendations that you see in this guidance through brief and districts should consider the vendors to do so too. And we wanna see our vendors actually following the same guidance as well because it can't just be up to the school districts and the procurement experts in districts to know how to buy the right thing. Vendors should be selling us the right things as well. And so our guidance ad addresses that as well. So that's the first thing in the brief. The second thing, is the Department of Education is developing a government coordinating council. You heard Secretary Cardona mention it. He believes in intentional collaboration. This is real action, not just words around it. We're putting this into place. It's an opportunity to coordinate activities and policy and communication between federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial governments so that we can all work together in the kindergarten model of teamwork. We'll make the dream work on this one. We will work together to strengthen the cyber defenses of resilience for the K-12 schools. We can facilitate formal and ongoing collaboration. Stay in constant conversation. Don't just wait for the crisis to happen. Ongoing, formal, informal collaboration. Kind of like a lot of you, I think, did last night at Old Ebbett. Oh, uh, that's another story. <laughs> That's the informal part of the coordinating council. Glad to hear you all had fun there, though. I appreciate that. I heard, I got an update about that. This is our department's strategy, having this government coordinating council to work together to protect the schools and the districts that we care so much about from these cybersecurity threats. The threats are not going to stop, but we know what to do. And it's up to us to prepare ourselves, support districts, to prepare for this, to respond to and to recover from cybersecurity attacks. So. As educators, we lead in our ability to collaborate. This is what we do best. We want to keep doing it. We want to break down the silos. And I personally, being new to Washington, D.C., am very grateful to see our government in action and to see our president and first lady, along with the secretaries across agencies, the National Security Council, all of my friends across CISO, FBI, you all came to help and to support with real action and real support. So on behalf of all the nation's schools, we thank you for the collaborations and from the Department of Education, we are here to provide real meaningful, timely resources for you. Thank you very much, Cindy. So turning now to the FCC, the chairwoman of the, of the FCC couldn't join us uh, once the event was rescheduled. So honored to introduce Ramesh Nagarajan, chief legal advisor to the chairwoman to announce some important FCC commitments in this space. Yes, thank you. Um, and yes, as you said, um, unfortunately with the schedule change, the chairwoman couldn't make it today. She's, uh, she was on a flight this morning uh, to, uh, to, uh, to visit NASA uh, uh, in Florida. Um, so you might be wondering why the FCC is here at this White House discussion on back to school safety and cybersecurity. Well, as many of you know, it's because the FCC runs the longest standing ed tech program in the country. To understand how that came to be, let's go back to 1996. That's when I tied up my parents' phone line by spending all day connecting to AOL. <laughs> Maybe you did too. <laughs> but back in 96, Congress had the foresight to, to task the FCC with, what's, with developing what became known as the E-Rate program. E-Rate was visionary because Congress saw clearly, back in 96, that it would be a good idea to bring high-speed internet service to every school and library in this country. In the years since, this program's been a quiet powerhouse. It's supported broadband in schools and libraries across urban America, rural America, and everything in between. And because great programs don't thrive without continuous attention and care, the FCC has, has improved this program from low speed to high speed connections and from wired connections to wireless connections and Wi-Fi connections. While the E-Rate program has been focused on supporting basic connectivity, we've heard loud and clear from stakeholders that cybersecurity is an increasing concern. That's because schools, as we have heard today, are becoming a, a prime target for cyber attacks. And perhaps the most concerning is the rash of ransomware attacks on schools, including in districts like Los Angeles, like Superintendent Carvalho told us today, as well as in Baltimore, Miami, Day, Minneapolis, and over 1,600 districts across the country. This is a problem just too big and too complex for any one agency to handle alone. It requires a whole of government approach, like the First Lady told us today. So here's what we're doing at the FCC to support that whole of government approach. The chairwoman has proposed to her colleagues that the FCC establish a pilot program to support cybersecurity services for K-12 schools and libraries. This pilot program would run for three years with a budget of $200 million. This pilot program will help provide all of us here today with valuable insights about how to leverage government resources to address the cybersecurity threats that schools and libraries face. A central theme that we plan on exploring in the pilot program is how to complement the work of our partners at CISA and the Department of Education with greater experience and more programs in this area. We also look forward to incorporating the recommendations in the joint brief that was just mentioned into our pilot program and seeing how we can fund those. 
At the FCC, we're proposing to establish the pilot program within the Universal Service Fund, but separate from the E-rate program. Based on the public record, we think this is the best way to, to make sure that gains in cybersecurity don't come at the cost of undermining E-rate success and promoting digital equity and basic connectivity. Ultimately, our goal here is to learn from this effort, identify how to get the balance right, and provide our federal, state, and local government partners, including all of you gathered here today, with actionable data about the most effective and coordinated way to address this growing problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramesh, for this meaningful commitment from the FCC to really help schools. So now to close out our panel, I'd like to turn it to, again, to the director of CISA, Jen Easterly. Great. Thanks so much, Anne. You know, I know most people in this room probably know what CISA is, what we do, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. We love security so much we needed it twice in our name. <laughs> Uh, that wasn't my doing. But we are the newest agency in the federal government, so just about uh, five years old this November. But we're not a regulator. Uh, we don't collect intel. We're not law enforcement. We're not military. We are entirely a voluntary agency who works every single day to build trusted partnerships. And it's why we spend so much time and why we've built our field presence working with our partners at state and local, with our working with our federal partners, working with our industry partners to ensure that we are always adding value, that we're being transparent, that we're being responsive. And so the first thing that I'd mention is as we talk about what we're doing, uh, please, please continue to give us feedback. Uh, I know our CIOs and CISOs will always give us that feedback because we hear it pretty constantly, but I would ask for everybody because this is something that we absolutely have to do as a team. Uh, just a couple things on what we've done and what we are doing. As the secretary mentioned, you know, a lot of this comes down to resources. And so we just announced that second tranche of our state and local cybersecurity grant program, which is fantastic, came with the infrastructure bill, uh, $375 million. We wrote specific language in there about protecting our schools. So please make sure you take a good look at it work with your CIOs who manage that. And if you have any questions at all, we have our region, uh, regional field personnel who are in every state. You can reach out to them. We actually just put something up on our webpage, cisa.gov, that points you to all of these resources. As I mentioned earlier, the toolkit that we developed that was really sparked by the LAUSD uh, incident, we've been working with schools, engaging to ensure that you all understand the simple steps that can be taken to help drive down risk. Of course, my favorite is enabling multi-factor authentication, but this is a very sophisticated audience, so I'm sure you all already all have that done. Uh, Cindy mentioned the terrific collaboration on digital and resilient infrastructure. Shout out to you, my friend, of course, and Mike Klein and Elena Clark on my team who did amazing work on this. One of the things that we worked hard to do was to align the recommendations in the brief with our cybersecurity performance goals, which we created actually uh, at the idea of Ann Neuberger to help simplify uh, what schools and what entities can do in terms of cost, complexity, and impact uh, so that they could do this uh, with limited resources. So we're very excited about getting that out there. Um, these resources also include our stopransomware.gov. Now that was created last year to bring together all of the resources of the federal government. So if you haven't seen that, please take a look at it. It talks about what to do beforehand, what to do if you've been attacked, and then how to rebuild afterwards. One of the other things that we've done is, is our pre-ransomware notification initiative where we get tips uh, from threat intel and industry who are seeing ransomware being laid down. And then we call out using our field personnel and we say, hey, there's something you can do to prevent having the worst day possible. So if you get a call from something, somebody in CISA, please pick up the phone. <laughs> we find very creative ways to find you if you don't pick up the phone, though. We've done this over 600 times, and we've done it to 48 K-12 school, K schools and school districts. So we really are out there putting a lot of resources against this. A uh, couple other things, very exciting. We're doing our second annual national summit on K-12 school safety coming up in November. So please check us out for that. We just released yesterday acquisition planning guidance 
so that uh, you and your schools and school districts know what you should be asking your vendors for. And we had a terrific workshop. Vendors here came and joined us yesterday to talk about Secure by Design, my second favorite topic, which is really about shifting the burden from schools and individuals onto those technology providers so that security comes out of the box. And then last, uh, in the coming year, we are going to ramp up our engagements with schools and school districts, at least 300 additional tailored assessments where we sit with you, we help you prioritize what you need to do, and then we stick with you as you look to implement it. So uh, look for that. We're also doing exercises. You've heard a lot about the virtue of exercises, how important that is. It's the uh, safety, it's the fire drill of cyber. So we're gonna do more of those. We're trying to do 12 uh, in the coming year, one a month. You know, at the end of the day, this is all about building resilience. And we know that that's hard work, but we have your back. We're here with you, with the federal government, uh, and we look forward to our work together. So thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you all for the fantastic announcements of government commitments in the space and for your own personal leadership driving those commitments. So I'll now invite our next panel to join us on stage. As we've heard quite a bit, we can do more to prevent cyber attacks in the first place, starting with the security of systems and software used in our schools. As our education system has increasingly turned to digital tools, private sector ed tech providers play a more important role in ensuring our schools are safe. So in this next panel, we'll turn to leading companies for some exciting announcements about the commitments they are making in support of cybersecurity in K-12 schools. I'll start with introducing Kim Majuris, Vice President for Global Education and U.S. State and Local Government at Amazon Web Services. Thank Kim. you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here today um, and discuss how the tech industry, education sector, and government could come together and collaborate to support the K-12 K through community as we continue to address these cyber risks and threats. But first, I'd like to thank the First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, Dr. Miguel Cardona, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, for convening this esteemed group. But I'd like to thank you specifically. Your persistence um, to make this event happen is appreciated, and we're excited to be a part of it. Um, when you look at a recent study, a global study in 2023, 80% of K through 12s had experienced a cyber breach. When you think about that ransomware attack and you think of the challenges that it presents to those K through 12s, those rising concerns with those threats are continuing to impact day in and day out. So it's exciting to hear of the resources that are being put together. These attacks come at huge risks from a cost perspective. Not only is it the legal expenses, the cyber insurance costs that increase, but also, and most importantly, the impact to lost instructional time for our students. To prevent these critical issues um, and impact education institutions themselves, we understand it must be a collaborative approach for all of us. And AWS knows that innovation is gonna continue to drive and address some of these actual concerns. We're in constant collaboration and we're, it's consistent with what each one of the institutions are asking for by ways of support. So we are excited to be a part of supporting K through 12 institutions, Department of Education, um, to help them and ed techs to focus on what they need to do and that is to provide learning platforms that are secure as we continue to make security our top priority. AWS has been architected to be the most flexible and secure cloud computing environment available today. Our cloud infrastructure is secure by design and secure by default. Our infrastructure services meet the high bar that the US government, as well as many of our customers request, and they set that bar high. To continue to bolster our commitment to K through 12, we are excited and so proud to commit the following resources. To help schools implement, so I think this is more about the before, we are excited to commit $20 million to support new and existing customers to establish their K through 12 security posture. 
Upskilling and reskilling of K-12 resources is so important. Giving them the tools necessary, we're excited to provide AWS Skill Builder, which has custom content to support their understanding of how cyber could impact their environment. So we have to upskill and reskill those resources. We will offer the during, so we, we hear about during, we will offer incident response team support. If you are an institution that is experiencing a challenge, we have resources that can also support you to ensure that you're able to secure your environment and protect the information that you have. And lastly, ed techs. We are partnered with many ed techs, some here as well today. We will offer free, well-architected framework security reviews to ensure that they are secure as they supply mission-critical applications to the schools themselves. We're honored and we're so excited to participate in the Return Back to School Safely and Safety Initiative. We're here to support, but most importantly, we continue to strive to enhance all of our infrastructure and services to ensure that our customers and partners benefit from our standards and our security measures. I look forward to watching the consumption of opportunity to learn and be curious about how we can support and how they could secure their environments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. I wanted to lift up two things Kim said that tie to De Deputy Secretary Martin's comments earlier. First, the security of the software schools buy is tied to the security they demand. You're buying software demand that it meet the highest security standards. And I think the Department of Education and CISA are jointly, are jointly sharing procurement guidance as well. So that's a request for schools to use the power of the purse. The federal government has done so as well in President Biden's executive order to say, we have to request and show what matters when we're buying tech. So you made the point very much, Kim. So that is the first. And then the second, I would say, is added resources during an incident are something to lean on, both the, both the FBI's, private sector resources, because in many cases, there is the speed of recovery is how many hands can get on deck. So with that, I'd like to turn to Zaid Said, head of US public policy at Cloudflare. Thank you, De thank you Deputy National Security Advisor uh, Neuberger. Um, thank, thank you to Dr. Biden for hosting us. Um, thank you to Secretary Mayorkas and Secretary Cardona and all of their staff um, who've been working to put this together and to pull it together a second time today. Um, Cloudflare is a security, performance, and reliability company helping to build a better internet. And today we're announcing Project CyberSafe Schools um, to help secure some of our nation's most important and vulnerable groups. Through this new initiative, Cloudflare commits to helping support eligible K-12 public school districts by providing email security and DNS filtering for faster, safer internet browsing. I'm here today with my colleague, Matt Schneider, who's head of public sector sales, and his team will be integral to helping to, uh, to, uh, for this new initiative. Project CyberSafe Schools will provide K-12 public school districts in the United States with, with up to, with, that have up to 2,500 students access to a package of Zero Trust cybersecurity services for free with no time limit. There's no catch and no underlying obligations. Um, so that is 9,000 school districts out of 13,000 school districts in the United States have fewer than 2,500 uh, students. We've already gotten our first inquiry as, as we were sitting here um, from a small school district in Minnesota uh, with 700 students to apply for our services. So we'll be contacting them to get them going. Um, eligible organizations will benefit from email protection, which safeguards inboxes and cloud email security by protecting against a broad spectrum of threats like phishing and unintentional leaks of sensitive data. And second, DNS filtering, which protects against internet threats by preventing users from reaching unwanted or harmful online content like ransomware or phishing sites and can be deployed to comply with the Children's Internet Protection Act. In announcing our commitment, Cloudflare's co-founder and CEO, Matthew Prince, noted that every day, our schools face cyber attacks that can slow internet access, threaten leaks of confidential student data, and hinder their ability to teach students in a secure and online space. As another school year is set to begin, we are committed to helping our nation's schools better protect themselves 
so they can focus on what they do best, teaching children. We launched the Project CyberSafe Schools website yesterday and published a blog, a blog piece today which gives more details about the program. And if you think your school district is eligible, you can go to the website, which is kind of a mouthful, www.cloudflare.com backslash LP backslash cybersafe dash schools. <laughs> or you can also search for Project <laughs> Safe Saving Schools. Clearly somebody in Minnesota found the website and, and has already, <laughs> has already um, applied. But we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Cloudflare for that generous commitment. This is a particularly important commitment for two reasons. As the director of CISA, CISA has published many times, one major way that entities are hacked is through spear phishing. So secure email has a major impact in that way. And the way that malicious software, malware, often communicates to the malicious command and control is via DNS. So those two sets of protections are very impactful for schools. And we look forward to counting how many of small schools now are behind that protective barrier. So with that, we'd like to turn to Hardeep Gulati, the CEO of PowerSchool. Welcome, Hardeep. Thank you, and Good morning, everyone. Hardeep Gulati, I'm the CEO of PowerSchool. First, let me uh, thank uh, First Lady, Department of Education, Department of Homeland Security, uh, National uh, Debris Security Advisor, as well as many federal agencies to really make this into a national priority. So thank you for that commitment and bringing this community together. It's, um, it's a real honor to be speaking here and uh, representing PowerSchool and, you know, giving our, reaffirming our commitment to make sure that we are part of this K-12 technology ecosystem. Now, one of the things I think a lot of people don't know about PowerSchool outside the tech sector, but we are one of the most pervasive enterprise applications running the schools, school operations, our Schoology Classroom Solutions, our talented uh, teacher recruitment and empowerment solutions, our analytics, our uh, now young college and career planning. I think all the educators in the room at some point might have heard about PowerSchool. <laughs> now what you probably don't uh, know is that we actually touch 45 million students across all 50 states with at least one of our solutions. That's represented by 80% of the North American school districts, 90 of the top 100, many are represented here as well as 25 Department of Educations. What's exciting about is that we really take security as one of our top priorities with very dedicated investment. And in fact, if, I'll just give you the magnitude of this. We, in last year, successfully defended against one billion cyber attack events just on our PowerSchool solutions with our customers. That's the magnitude we're dealing with. And we know that's just a small fraction of the full security threat our school districts face every day. Most of the districts have dozens, if not hundreds, of different systems, some legacy, manual processes. Every one of those integrations and touch points create vulnerabilities and risks which our districts don't have the resources to manage all those exponential risks. Well, at PowerSchool, we help a lot of districts with their transformation of their digital cloud so we can really help them with automation and man, you know, getting into adoption of technology. But we also make sure that they are getting the best cybersecurity infrastructure. We do that by a relentless investment and focus on every element of security with dedicated team, but also partnering with uh, cloud providers like AWS and Microsoft, with Cloudflare, with for Firewall, vulnerability scans, penetration testing, supporting industry standards uh, like SOC2, partnering with industry consortiums like COSIN and OneNet Tech. And what's important is in terms of not only making sure that we are providing the best security infrastructure, we also know that we need to do more. So this is why we're excited about actually launching a new offering, a free and subsidized security as a service that we can reach any customer, irrespective of whether they use PowerSchool solution or not. So offering courses, tools, assessments, as well as training and education, thanks to support by AWS, as well as No4B and other uh, providers who are actually partnering with us to make sure that we can create a human firewall that allows our districts and students to be protected against all the different malicious attacks. We know we, there's a lot of work ahead of us, but we also have a huge opportunity to empowering teachers, 
bringing technology to make sure that we can support every child with the best education they deserve. But that starts with the foundation of data privacy and data security. And we're really excited about partnering with this community on our mission to make sure that we can support personalized education for every student journey. So thank you again for giving us this opportunity. Thank you very much, Hardeep. It was really good to hear about the reach of PowerSchool. Let's talk to John Solomon. John Solomon, Google's Vice President of Chrome OS and Google for Education. John, over to you. Thank you, Anne. On behalf of Google, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for, to First Lady Biden, to Secretaries Cardona and Mallorcas for having the foresight of arranging this at this event, and, and for your leadership, I much appreciate it, and your staff. Uh, cybersecurity has never been a more pressing concern, and Google stands ready to partner with uh, our uh, colleagues in the industry, with civil society overall, and to work with government to combat this pressing concern. We have considerable expertise, and we're ready to put it to work. You know, stepping back for a second, uh, core to Google's mission of organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible is learning. And learning happens at home, at school, at university, and throughout life. But we have a specific group at Google that I represent today, which is Google for Education. And Google for Education is focused on the part of learning that happens in schools and universities. And in Google for Education, we have created a platform that is, consists of Workspace, our Google Workspace for Education product, and Chromebooks. Now, the importance of this platform is it creates a safe digital environment. And this digital environment has been adopted broadly. In fact, just to put some numbers on it, there are 170 million users here in the US and around the world using Google Workspace for Education. Chromebooks are the preferred device in K-12 globally. They're the number one device, both here in the US and around the world, with over 50 million users. Now, core tenets of how we design these products are user privacy, a topic that's come up today, and security. We strongly uh, believe and ensure that user data, student data, school data, stays where it belongs, which is at the school. Nobody else has access to it, not any other companies, and certainly not Google. Now, to put a fine point on security, it's worth noting that there's never been a reported ransomware attack on a Chromebook or any device running Chrome operating system. And we don't believe this is an accident. This is because Google applies the principle of secure by design to Chromebooks. And this is the result. Now the infrastructure that Google for Education runs on is the very same infrastructure that the products you know so well, such as Google Search, Google Maps, YouTube, run on. And this is the infrastructure trusted by none other than the US Department of Defense and many others. Now our news today is we published, well it was actually yesterday, so a caveat, <laughs> um, a cybersecurity handbook. And the purpose of the cybersecurity handbook is an easy to use, practical, actionable set of steps that schools can take to harden their security posture to have better defense. And we're really excited about it. It brings the best of Google's expertise into the hands of school administrators. Now this is in conjunction with the work we're doing and the investment we're making in training. So recently, Google.org announced a $20 million investment as part of the Consortium for Cybersecurity to help train university students at 20 universities across the country so they can go out into their communities and help harden local infrastructure with improved security uh, procedures. So in close, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you again to the administration for bringing this forum together, to making these actionable steps uh, available to schools. You know, when we read the digital infrastructure brief, 
to check the language, what it was called, published yesterday, the words that jumped out at us were defensible, resilient, and secure by design. This is entirely consistent with Google's philosophy of how we do security. And we want to give teachers the confidence, as the First Lady talked about, to be able to walk into the classroom and teach with confidence using technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And finally, I'll turn it over to John Baker, CEO of D2L. Thank you very much, Anne. I want to start by thanking the First Lady uh, for her incredible passion and energy and care uh, for this very important topic and for all the leaders that are in this room uh, for convening us uh, to get us together to have this discussion and to put us on a different path for the future. So I started uh, my company, D2L, in my third year of university uh, because I was wrestling with one key question. What's the most important problem that I could solve that would have the biggest impact on the world? And I thought of it then, and I still think there's nothing more important today, which is there's nothing more important than helping to transform the way the world learns. Because learning, as many people know, uh, ripples from one person to the next, through our schools, through our communities, through our companies, through our country. It's the foundation upon which we solve some of the big challenges that we all face today. Uh, and so I set out uh, to build a learning platform that could break down barriers, that get in the way of high-quality educational experiences, and to engage and inspire people to achieve more than they ever even dreamed possible. Uh, and so as we do this important work, uh, the foundation for that is security and privacy. Um, you know, we, we've worked very closely with customers over the years to implement uh, authorization and, and authentication encryption by default uh, and other layered protections. And we've led our industry by achieving numerous NIST and ISO uh, and other security certifications. Uh, we recognize that this also does not stop. Uh, this work is ongoing, and that's why we're all here today, to acknowledge that this is a security imperative and to protect our students, our children, uh, our educators, and our schools with this important initiative. We're committed to this ongoing work with our customers and partners and to continuously improving our security, knowing that there are always new challenges and threats ahead. So we've... Sorry. <laughs> We've launched three new initiatives uh, that are aligned to this particular initiative. You know, today we have over 1,800 technologies that integrate into our learning platform. So what we're doing is we're now extending our work to do information security reviews of some of those key uh, technology partners to help lift the burden uh, from the schools. We also recognize that learning, upskilling, is at the heart of this challenge. And so we're going to be working with uh, a number of different key industry-leading security uh, experts on training services for our, our schools. Uh, we're also going to be developing different programs. Uh, and many of our clients already use our learning platform to deliver training to their staff. And so this would be a great way for them to extend uh, the, the development of these critical cyber uh, skills for their employees and for their students. And as part of that, we want to launch a new user group to bring together peers to talk through the issues, to share knowledge and share best practices and how to respond to these uh, critical incidents. And third and final, we will continue to expand our work with audited third parties to validate our software, our people, our controls, to ensure that we're doing our best to in incorporate these practices into the building of our technology and the providing of services to our clients. As a company, we strive to be secure by design, private by design, and we think of these things as the bedrock upon which we do all of our business. We're pleased to join the efforts uh, here today by the United States federal government and other partners to secure our K-12 schools and to lift the quality of cybersecurity in the nation, to do our part to protect our customers. We thank you for inviting me today and for allowing D2L to provide support for this very critical initiative. Thank you. Thank you to each of you and to your companies for your partnership and the support and effort. Thank you very much. So it is my hope that schools across the country tap into the resources that were talked about today, both government and private sector, to strengthen schools' defenses and resilience in the face of cyber attacks. Last school year, schools in Arizona, California, Washington, Massachusetts, 
West Virginia, Minnesota, New Hampshire, and Michigan were all victims of major cyber attacks. And while resources, like those announced today from the federal government and from our private sector partners, are certainly essential, we continue to learn lessons from folks on the ground, folks battling cyber attacks from those who are most affected at schools. So with that, I'd like to turn it to the final panel of today, a group of experts whose work has been particularly innovative and inspiring, who share approaches to securing schools' data and networks against cyber attacks. Thank you all for joining us today. So first, I'd like to introduce Vanessa Wren, CIO for the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Vanessa. Thank you so much. I am honored to be here today to share with you North Carolina's approach to protecting our students' well-being, the most sensitive data, and certainly keeping the operations of our school. Thank you so much for putting this community together and allowing us to share this information. Like other states, North Carolina, and we've heard a lot about it today, we are data rich, we're resource thin. And um, because of that, we've seen an increase in cyber threats, particularly post-COVID. Since July of 2022, we've experienced 36 cyber incidents in our state that required some type of incident response. So to meet these challenges, um, we've done two key things in our state um, to combat that. North Carolina has created the Joint Cybersecurity Task Force. Um, and like we heard earlier, you need a Rolodex. That is our Rolodex. Um, the Joint Cybersecurity Task Force is connected with our federal partners and um, can often be on the ground within hours. So I'll go a little bit more about that in just a second, but it was a two-pronged approach. We've also created the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction's K-12 cybersecurity program. So the JCTF consists of the North Carolina Emergency Management, Department of Information Technology, the National Guard, the local government information system strike team, and certainly there are seats on there for our FBI and our Secret Service when needed. So we're dialed immediately up to all the federal support available to us. The JCTF provides incident response and recovery to all of our schools if needed. And it's important to note, if an incident happens in any one of the North Carolina 2,780 schools, they are required to report that incident to me and to our centralized IT. And we're also legislatively prohibited from paying any type of ransomware. So um, we too do not negotiate with terrorists. So the JCTF is really critical. And um, one of the things we've done is to make sure everyone's aware that it's there and uh, we mobilize immediately when needed. The second part of this is the DPI, the Department of Public Instruction um, Cybersecurity Program. We're providing governance, resources, and actually managed solutions to reach the goal of prevention and hardening our posture. This, we created an office in our agency just to have regional support. We just rolled out a very robust data exchange agreement um, because we found that when we do have an incident, it is coming from third parties. So a key component to that has been training all of our technology leaders who lead our schools, training our teachers. Our teachers have accessed over 325,000 training and phishing simulations in the last two years. We are essentially acting as the SOC, the Security Operations Center for our schools because we have provided so many managed services. Some of those include advanced endpoint protection, network asset discovery, next gen firewall. That next gen firewall is blocking about 100,000 attempts every rolling seven day average. So we're also doing malware filtering and advanced solutions. So safe, successful, and happy, those is, are the desires of every parent for our children. So we've taken those core tenets and we've used those things to make sure we have built out a program that can be the key to success, which is trifold, and we've heard it here today, funding, partnerships, and resources. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you today. I'm very honored to do this. Thank you very much, Vanessa. I'll now turn to Michael Gregg, the CISO for North Dakota's IT. Thank you, and uh, thanks to everyone. Not 
Thanks to everyone for having me here today. I just wanted to start off by saying North Dakota's taken a little bit of a different approach to cybersecurity. As you can probably guess, it's sometimes hard for us to find talent and find the people we need. My team overall protects about 250,000 endpoints on any one given day, and we do it on about half the staff of a Fortune 30 company. Now, it's not always easy, as I said, to recruit and train these individuals, so we've taken a very strong role on education and training. And that really starts with the state. Under our governor's leadership, we've passed the first in the nation cyber education bill, that's 1398. Under that bill, that requires cyber education is taught in every grade of K-12. But it doesn't end there. When we get to junior high and high school, we have our cyber madness competition. This yearly Capture the Flag event allows us to have students work together as teams and use real world tools and techniques to solve cyber challenges. The winners are awarded scholarships, which helps them pay for their college education. And I can tell you one of the things I will never forget this last year was parents coming to me at the conclusion of the Cyber Madness event and telling me that their child, their daughter, getting that money and that scholarship made the difference in them being able to send their daughter to school and her continue her college education. We've also aligned with our state universities and colleges, and our tri tribal colleges really play a key part there. So Turtle Mountain and others are actively engaged in this and work toward that. Now, North Dakota cyber programs don't end there, and our education programs don't end there. We actively recruit and we actively hire interns and apprenticeships. My team brought on the first cyber apprentice in the state of uh, North Dakota, and now the House and the Senate has approved multiple more that will be hired and will be staffed throughout the state. We continue that when I bring people on. When I bring them on, we have a motto called sharpen the saw. That means we continue to learn and grow throughout. Part of that is our joint state cyber operations that we've formed. So we get together with other states. We've done a state exercise now for two years in a row. And for the second year, we brought together more than 12 states, 60 individuals from throughout those states to talk about what they would do in a major cyber incident and how they would respond, so how we would work together. Overall, these programs have provided great benefit to the state, help us grow our education throughout the state, and it really doesn't end there. Just a few months ago, my team was the only state team to make it in America's Cyber Cup Challenge. So out of 100 teams, my team was the only state team to actually make it. And out of that, my team for the first year that we've done this, we finished second place, beating many other well-known private industry teams. You'd think my team would be happy there, but they told me immediately afterwards, don't worry, next year we're taking number one. <laughs> so I'd just like to close and thank everyone for the opportunity to be here today and to talk a little bit about what North Dakota is doing with cyber education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. I'll now turn to Terry Liftus, the Assistant Superintendent and CIO of San Diego. I'm gonna go ahead and start with a quote from the CISO website. Uh, there is no more important institution to the future prosperity and strength of the United States than our own nation's K-12 education system. And I think everybody in this room believes that. Again, uh, I, actually, I'll say good afternoon. I guess technically we have traversed into afternoon. Uh, <laughs> my name is Terry Loftus. I have the pr privilege and honor of serving the 550,000 students and staff of San Diego County, including our largest school district, uh, San Diego Unified, uh, an innov innovative district uh, previously expertly led by our deputy secretary. Um, and, and, and officials in this room today have really talked about and articulated some of the impacts of cybersecurity incidents. Uh, and I would share another word of caution uh, as we go forward. The the K-12 sector uh, is far from having a clear understanding of the breadth and depth of the risk landscape. For example, California has over 1,000 school districts serving nearly 6 million students, the vast majority of which have never had a comprehensive vulnerability assessment. The reality is most K-12 institutions simply don't know that they've had an incident unless it's made visible by the threat actor, in, such as in the event of a ransomware demand. 
To start, it's important that our institutions adopt a strategy and a framework to evaluate and address cyber risks. My colleague David Thurston and I have championed the adoption of CIS Controls Framework at California's 58 county offices of education, and in turn, our county offices are now working with our schools, school districts, and charter schools to implement those controls as well. Hiding, highlighting CIS, MSISAC, and CISA for a moment, uh, these organizations represent increasingly important partners to the K-12 community. Individuals like Director Easterly uh, has been key in helping raise awareness about the profound impact of attacks on K-12 education. I'd also like to share some bright spots, though, uh, with everybody today, because an asset-based mindset is important for our students and also for all of us in this room. In San Diego, we're providing insights via vulnerability assessments and follow-up support uh, at little or no cost to our LEAs. We're helping K-12 districts to enroll in programs like MSISAC for free, uh, my favorite F word, uh, and assisting in the implementation of the CIS controls, as mentioned earlier. California K-12 school districts have also faced a surge of DDoS attacks in recent years. Thankfully, a partnership between the County Offices of Education, the CDE, and a CNIC, the Statewide Research and Education Network, have built out a DDoS mitigation service that is now available and lit up for every single educational agency in the state free of charge. In recent years, uh, my SDCUE Cyber Guardians team has also delivered a number of statewide trainings and resources uh, on, on controls such as MFA. We have a, a, a current uh, a goal, a SMART goal, to implement MFA at all of our county offices of education by the end of this year, which we're excited about. Uh, my SDCUE team has also designed and developed a phishing awareness, training, and testing platform called Red Herring that in the last two years, we've had over 200 school districts, county offices, and charter schools uh, implement this platform. So today we've got over 221,000 educators, teachers, administrators uh, of all types uh, that are leveraging this platform to reduce the risk of phishing attacks, which is still our number one attack vector. At SDC, we we're in the initial stages of building a new K-12 Cyber Operations Center in San Diego, and I have more examples, but uh, I, I must be transparent in noting that the work happening in San Diego uh, is not the norm. I'm very, very thankful to have a superintendent and a board of education that's allocating the funding for these initiatives. In fact, I would say this is a call to all administrators out there, superintendents, boards, and otherwise, uh, as mentioned earlier, that we need to make this a priority. The way forward in my mind is clear. K-12 must continue to innovate and evolve uh, best practices, and we must build more robust and purposeful partnerships between K-12 entities, the U.S. Department of Education, and our federal and state partners. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Terry. I'd now like to turn it over to Doug Case, the Executive Director of the Kinetic Commission for Education Technology. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Advisor, and uh, really uh, commend Dr. Biden, uh, Secretary Cardona, who we miss in Connecticut, by the way, and, uh, and, and Secretary Mayorkas and, and the, the broader community here. Uh, I am Doug Casey. I serve with the Department of Administrative Services uh, it, directly as the executive director for our Commission for Educational Technology. Uh, our interagency commission was created 25 years ago with the simple mission of making sure that technology was equi equitably available for teaching and learning at the K-12 higher education and library levels. And uh, one of the first things that we did was to establish a research and education network uh, similar to the one that Terry just mentioned, uh, that provides high-speed, uh, symmetrical, multi-gigabit connections to every single school, every university, every state agency, and soon to be every single library. And so taking that uh, continuum of education view of cybersecurity is really important. In addition to believing that equity of speed is important, we also believe that a secure connection is a matter of equity. And so for those reasons, we've layered on uh, cybersecurity protections in the form of content filtering to abate uh, human engineering attacks as well as DDoS attacks, which uh, if you're not familiar with those, read about, about them in the papers. They essentially would shut down a network for days if not weeks, and uh, shutting those off has been a huge benefit to our, our schools and universities. 
Uh, another thing that we've done in Connecticut that I would encourage you to look into is uh, apprenticeship programs, uh, training up the next generation of cybersecurity experts. In addition to the skills, in addition to the micro-credentials, we really put a focus through programs like our Cyber Hub onto the importance of mentorships and partnerships so that people who are coming up in this field don't just have uh, the technical skills, but they've got a human being that they can lean into and, uh, and seek uh, advice for as they progress in their, in their careers. And the final thing I would mention uh, is an initiative that every state is working on, which is the Digital Equity Plan. Uh, our commission is leading the Digital Equity Plan for the state of Connecticut. Uh, we commend the administration uh, for, uh, and, and President Biden for signing this into law in November 2021. Uh, part of this uh, digital equity plan, there's a strong cybersecurity component in this. So we look at every single one of our residents, whether they're little kids or older adults, as being the endpoints that we need to make sure we equip with the skills and protections to make sure that they are uh, well protected in, in the 21st century digital world. So with that, I will hand it back to you. Thank you. And finally, I'll introduce Jared Mader, Director of Educational Technology for Lincoln, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. And obviously, thank you. I don't know how I would repeat everything that the 20 panelists have, have said. Um, and thank you so much, Anne, for the, in the, the run of the play here today for putting me last, uh, because doing so <laughs> is fantastic. Um, it is my honor and privilege to represent Pennsylvania. Uh, we have a pro an approach in PA that is very intermediate unit centric. Now, if you don't know what an intermediate unit is, it's an educational service agency. In Pennsylvania, we like to be a little bit different and, and call it something a little bit different. But what you heard across all of the panelists today was really about the importance of collaboration. And those individuals not represented here today are the many, many frontline defenders who are back. The reason why we all can be here, by the way, because they're doing the real work. They're doing the important work of, uh, of really keeping at the forefront the protections that so many of us count on. And so when I think about that, I really feel like I, I started my career 25 years ago in the chemistry classroom. Don't line up for that. Um, I know that <laughs> I can do some tutoring afterwards. Uh, left that career uh, to enter into educational technology. And from the very beginning, the digital divide existed. Then we called it the homework divide. Students going home and not having the access. Today, we have a security divide. Coming from that intermediate unit perspective, where I serve 25 school districts ranging from 600 students up to 10,000, there is absolutely a divide in service. And so what we in Pennsylvania are doing is putting in, in place systems that allow the intermediate units to really step up we serve as an RWAN provider, internet services, thanks to E-Rate and the, the wonderful services that we have there as consortium lead. We're able to, in that same exact business type of model, work with our, we often say that our partners, our private sector partners, are just as much customers as our school districts because they want to succeed as much as we want them to succeed in the K-12 footprint. And so we help to bring those two together. Using a shameless chemistry kind of uh, analogy, we see ourselves in, as intermediate units as the great emulsifier between the K-12 public schools, you liked that, didn't you, and, and the private sector. And so through those partnerships, we've brought consortias for MFA. We've brought consortias for fishing education for our teachers and our administrators to make sure they understand what they're even doing. Oftentimes, they don't even know when they're selecting those links or clicking on or filling in information. Most recently, we've partnered with K-12-6. Doug's in the, in the crowd here, and I cannot hesitate to give a shout out. We ran a two-day workshop. We were able to stream that live to about a dozen other intermediate units in, across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, covering almost half of the LEAs in Pennsylvania. Two-day workshop, building an incident response plan and going through an actual runbook where participants were able to actually exercise their plan and see if it actually would work. And so actual practical application for those individuals, bringing them out. I can't tell you how often they thank us for the things that they don't often get the privilege of being able to go on site and be able to be, take part of that, that type of collegiality with their peers. And that's what we need to be doing more often. So the education service agency model in partnership with MSISAC and CISA has been instrumental in making, making that be a success. So thank you to First Lady, 
Thank you, Anne, for bringing us here, and the secretaries. It has been an honor and privilege to be here today. Thank you. So thank you all for the valuable insights you shared. And I think to summarize the time we spent together this morning, we heard that protecting schools and kids needs three things, knowledge. And you heard from skilled, experienced individuals like the LA United superintendent who led both prevention and led incident response to a significant incident. Resources, both funds and people, and you heard about new commitments from both government and the private sector. And a thank you to the leaders who made those commitments happen. And we brought together people, people who do the work each day, skilled educators and administrators, and of course, representing the commitment, a teacher herself, the First Lady, and two secretaries, Secretary of Education, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, because fundamentally that partnership between educators and security experts is what will keep our schools and our kids safe. So we're excited, today is just the beginning, and we're excited both for those who joined us here today, those watching online, to tap into these resources to help schools be safe. So before closing, I want to take a moment to thank the individuals who made today's event happen, who are so committed to school safety. First, from the Office of the First Lady, Mala Adiga, DJ Sigworth, and Emma Stopek. From the White House Social Office, Liz Hart. From the NSC, Caitlin Clark, John Murphy, Caroline Pestel, and Michael Tam. And from the Department of Education, Mike Klein, Christina Ishmael, and Ramon Carranza, Jr. We hope that gathering here today to, will serve as a catalyst to help ensure that schools tap into the resources we talked about and ensure that our kids can go back to school safely. Thank you all for joining us today. Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the MCAD TV family. Please like and share MCAD TV. We love you all. Please support MCAD TV Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.